On the way here. Shalom of Racha. Hope everyone's uh, doing okay with that. I just want to check with the uh, the Zoomers as well if they can hear us okay, if everything's clear. Just give us a thumbs up if everything's good. Um, I want to make a special thank you for everyone who's turned up tonight. It's great to see everything happening. Friday night was wild to see the community almost rebuilt. Everybody out, everybody having a good time, everyone, everyone together. Um, the first time after COVID. Um, as mentioned, there are some refreshments and there's some cake and everything like that. Feel free to break share and can go get it. Um, I want to get straight into it because obviously we're on a time frame. Um, people would like to join me afterwards for, for Lachaim and for Marif. are welcome to do so. As we start the countdown to Pesach this Shabbat, as we start doing Pashat Shkalim, we start that announcement, we also start moving towards uh, Purim, which I don't know about you, it's a great, uh, it's a great festival, but it explores a lot of really interesting concepts. And I want to give some of the background, I want to give some of the historical background as well as some of the more Midrashic background to that. Um, and I hope that I'll, that will be okay. The recent events within the world, especially the coronavirus in the last few years, I hope it's caused all of us to have some very serious questions, both philosophical questions, hashkopic questions, these kinds of things. But whether or not, and no matter what the questions have been, I hope that there has been a unifying answer to a lot of it, which is that we really are not in full control of our situation. Really, at a moment's notice, things can go from great to terrible. We can go from feeling pretty free and everything's normal, to feeling pretty locked up, pretty chained up. We are all at the whim of forces beyond our control, whether that be in the political sphere, be in the financial sphere, medical sphere. Many of us like to pretend that we've got it all together. We like to pretend that everything is, is normative, everything's running smooth. But there could be a war tomorrow. There could be a disease tomorrow. There could be a financial event tomorrow. And for the Israelites in the book of Esther, this was really the case. This was really the case. We have to go back quite a bit to what is called the empire or the first Persian empire, the Archimedean empire. We have to understand that this empire was the largest empire that had ever existed previously. Now, before that, we had, there, had been, there had been other empires. In fact, there had been other Persian empires. They're not called the first Persian empire, interestingly enough. But it was a massive, massive, massive area. It ran from Eastern Europe all the way to the end of the Indus Valley. And as our, as our Pasuk teaches us in the beginning of the Book of Esther, 127 provinces from India to Namibia. Nubia. The first time that there is this massive area that is controlled by a centralized government. And a lot of the details of this civilization would be extremely familiar to us. We would have, for example, a centralized government, a multicultural policy, various religions, various languages, various worldviews going on all at the same time, which prior to that didn't happen. Prior to that, it tended to be that each civilization prided itself on pushing its own agenda. And with the beginning of the, of the great Persian empire, they began to celebrate the fact that they had absorbed all these different cultures. So we start to see things like, uh, standardized building infrastructures. We start to see things like road systems, postal services, all these kinds of things. There was even an official language. And this language um, was Elamite. And we know this from various different cuneiform uh, inscriptions and different kinds of things that exist. If you go to the British Museum, you can see a lot of great things that we stole from different countries um, and put on show. And uh, there's a lot of, um, of these, these rock inscriptions of the Elamite texts. And, and the reason that we know that the Elamite was the 
language of the people was because normally you get it next to older versions of the same text. So you find Akkadian, you find older Babylonian dialects, you find old Persian dialects, and it allows us to understand that Elamite was used as a sort of English of the old world, of the old Persian world. The Persians were able to have a civil service division. That means that they, they had bureaucrats. They also had to put up with bureaucrats. And they also had a professional army. And the general model of the Persian Empire served as a model for what would come later. It actually went so far that it existed all the way from the seventh century CE until its final defeat by Alexander the Great. Now that is a long, it's a long, long time to exist. And it's fascinating that Alexander the Great, he didn't just defeat it, but he also absorbed that culture. You know, it wasn't like, it wasn't like he, he ruined the whole thing. He absorbed the elements that he enjoyed and he put his own spin on it, but it was already a functioning society. So it was, it was only sort of a change of currency that, that occurred and also a change of management that occurred more than a complete destruction of the civilization. Although, although the history books like to, to point it out differently. According to most scholars, the Ahasuerus of the Book of Esther was identified with Xerxes. Now there's, there's two Xerxes, there's the first and the second. We're talking about the first, who reigned from 486 to four, uh, 465 CE. And the reason that we, it's important that we understand what Xerxes was, was mostly because his, his father was Darius the Great, and his grandfather was Cyrus the Great. If you've got some knowledge of Tanakh, you know that Cyrus is one of the most important people mentioned in the Tanakh. He's even referred to in multiple places as King Messiah, the only non-Israelite king to get this title. And even at the, at the end of the book of Chronicles, he is the last person mentioned in the Tanakh. So if you, if you want to skip to the good bit of the Tanakh, you split right to the end, you'll find that the last person mentioned isn't Moshe, it's, you know, flip all the way to the end of the Tanakh, it's Cyrus the Great. This is very important for us as Jews because the these were the people, the family that so to speak ended us being in the Babylonian exile and in slavery and returned us to our land. And even beyond that, helped us to rebuild the temple. We can begin to understand why perhaps Mordechai had such a devotion to the king. Why, why did he care about there was a plot to, to kill the king? There's a backstory, the great the grandfather of the king had saved the Jewish people. There was a hakara tatov from the Jewish people to, to the Persian Empire. And in this Persian Empire, the Archimedes Empire, the Israelites who lived there did fantastically well, just like Jews did well today, they do very well today. Unlike previous civilizations that had come and gone, the Israelites found that their society, their religion, their worldview wasn't spurned, wasn't hated, but was simply absorbed into the, into the general polemic. That, that's what happened. If suddenly Jews were doing very well, they, they had positions of power, they were able to hold down positions even within government for the first time. There was, there was business, there was inter-country uh, inter and inter-territory business that allowed people to do fantastically well, which was amazing for Jewish people. However, as we know from our story, things turned against the Israelites, much in the same way that when the Israelites were in Egypt, things changed very quickly. We know this uh, very famous pasuk, the Yakom Melech Hadash Amitzrayim Sheloya Dat Yosef, from the book of Shemot, right in the beginning. A new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And it's hard to find someone who doesn't know the corresponding Rashi there, that it wasn't a new king, but a change of attitude. Now we have somebody who pretends he doesn't know the Jewish people and everything's good. The switch is immediate. It goes from being a prosperous, favored position to being highly precarious. 
in the in the example of Egypt, it ends up being that they get led eventually into slavery, into being into building Ramses and Pithom. And in our story of, of Esther, it goes from being that they have security and they have a relative ease of life to the fact that they're all going to be annihilated immediately. For us as Jews, for anybody with any sense of history, it's obvious what the lesson is. It's not an easy lesson to tell over to people because it's not comfortable. No matter how secure and how affluent we become, no matter how in bed we are with the government, no matter how much we think we're safe, things change and they can change very, very quickly. The Jews in Europe, they were not necessarily at the begin beginning an oppressed people when the Nazi uh, party came into power. They held high positions of authority within government, within education, within finance, within business. It didn't help them at all. In fact, as we, we all know, that story ended very, very tragically. We live in an extremely upside down world and it takes a, a great deal of courage to accept that it is upside down, that the people on the top are not necessarily the people who should be on the top. The people on the bottom are not people who are deserving necessarily of being on the bottom. In different times in history, it's been due to skin tone. Sometimes it's been due to religion. Sometimes it's been due to what kind of nationality people have been born into. But actually the distribution of wealth and the distribution of power in the world is extremely unfair. And it always has been. This is not a, a new thing of the, you know, of the 21st century, the disparity and, and the fairness of our society. This is something that has been Leola. It's been forever. In the Talmud, in Pesachim 50a, for everybody who's, who's uh, following Daph Yomi, they, they already had their siyam on Pesachim. Yeshua ben Levi explains that there are people who are considered important, Yikarim, and people who are considered unimportant. And Rabbi Yosef, the, the son of Yeshua ben Levi, he became extremely ill. He had a fever, he had a very high temperature, and he was about to die. And when he came back from this experience, his father seemingly said to him, what did you see? So we know that if you have a very high temperature, very high fever, very often you can have hallucinations, you can get very sick. And if, it, if you've had this experience, I guess living in Manila, you get a lot more tropical diseases, just like we're in India, there's things like um, malaria, there's things like dengue here. If you've ever got, got that, you know that you start to trip out a bit if you, if you get that kind of high temperature. He says, what did you see when you were about today? Die. Marata, what did you see? He said, I saw an inverted world. I saw an upside down reality. The people who are above here were below and the people who are below here were above. And his father answered him, you saw a true world. Olam Rati, you saw a clarified world, a world of clarity. The next world is not based on our social standing in this world. It's based only on our comportment, our morality, and our character. You could be a complete rasha, a wicked person, or not a particularly great person and achieve great things in this world. You could have all the titles, you could have a PhD, you could have a long beard, much longer than mine, I'm sure. You could have wealth, you could have greatness even. You could lead empires. That doesn't say anything about who you are, what you achieved, or where you would like to go and what, what you wanted to achieve with your life. And whilst the Jewish world has its share of greatness, and I'm just looking around the room, it's, it's hard not to be a little bit humbled. Entrepreneurs, doctors, lawyers, academics, thinkers, people with their, their finger on the pulse. Don't know what I'm doing here. That is not 
our actual purpose. The book of Isaiah, as I'm, I'm sure we all know, it's these famous Pesukim in 49.6, teaches us that it's the, the purpose of the Jewish people to be a light unto nations. What, what is this light? It's actually coming up in our week's Torah Pasha this week. We have to light the menorah. My daughter asked a great question. She said, when do you light the menorah? Day or at nighttime? Does, it, does anyone know the answer to this? It's, like, it's a good Mishnah question from the Rebbe. When do you light the menorah? Nakshon has always got his uh, finger on the pulse. Be shot to light it at night, but it turns out we've got a light when there already is light because it's not—it's not a sense of lighting for the sake of needing a physical light. We're a spiritual light unto nations. We come to teach a moral standpoint and a moral, a moral absolution that has come up and it's ended up inspiring various different religions to to mirror us. If you look at Islam, look at Christianity, look at Baha'i, look at various other religions and sects, by the way, there's, there's hundreds of religious sects within those three religions who are inspired by our example of trying to set a standard. And so it turns out that our primary role is not in the area of the free market, or uh, if you're in Israel, then you know startups or innovation, or even as many people have tried to interpret light into nations if within education. We're really here to be a moral and spiritual role model. And because we've set the standard so high, of course, the Tanakh is filled with failure. For me, the fact that the Tanakh is so filled with the, the discussion of how often we fail is probably the most refreshing thing in the planet. We don't have perfect people. We don't have perfect prophets. We don't have a perfect generation because we hold ourselves accountable. We don't have the prophet who was perfect or the guy who never said, we don't have that guy. That's not, that's not a realistic picture of humanity. We have people who strive to be the best and fail just like us. I don't know about you, but I, I've strived to do some amazing things. And I've also uh, had to be humbled a few times as well on the journey. It's important that our take on reality is a realistic one. It's not a, just a supernatural one. Of course, we're a supernatural people who live with Hashem, but we're also a realistic people who fail. We also get our hands dirty. We also have to make the Shuvah. Even the greatest amongst our people will get it wrong and have to make the Shuvah. In fact, if they didn't, they wouldn't be able to fulfill the mitzvah of the Shuvah. So they, you either, it's, a, it's an interesting idea, right? If you, if you don't do something wrong, you can't make the Shuvah, so you didn't fulfill the whole Torah. Even the people who are the best amongst us manage to upset their parents. People who are children manage, they know that we upset our parents. People of parents know that we're easily upset. But nonetheless, the most backwards element of our collective history is that the Jewish people don't tend to learn this lesson. And we fall each time into the focus basically on the superficial instead of the spiritual. I don't mean spiritual in terms of what you might create out of your mind should look spiritual because maybe for you that means sitting and learning all day long or maybe it means you're a bouse of car or this we tend to focus not on making ourselves into the best people we can be but the trappings of life and even these desires to be for example a bouse of car or to sit and learning very often they're just projections of a, of a weaker self they're not the same as us dealing with our core issues, dealing with the problems that we have and, and getting it right. That's a lot harder to deal with. That's, that, that requires real spiritual therapy. That requires a bit of pain, a bit of tears. The word Purim, as, we, as a lot of people know, seems to be related to the Persian word for lots. There's different ways that lots were cast. It seems that the oldest form of lots were that used to to place bits of stone into a pot. Um, various different systems exist using pieces of paper to, you know, I don't know if you were ever at school, but it might as well draw the straw shore. Different ways of, of doing this, different oracular systems or, or systems using oracle systems. The word poor in Hebrew, in Hebrew is related to porer, 
which means to dismantle, to break down, to break to crumbs. Effir, in, its, in that form of its verb, tends to mean cancellation, destruction of something permanent, breakdown of a, of a marriage. It's very serious. And it seems that this idea of drawing lots to determine things is really as old as time. It's really something that ancient peoples did. And it's something that we continue to do. You know, when no one wants to do the job, we, we draw the straw short, we have to do it. Even, even within our vernacular, we say, oh, I drew the straw short, I have to come to the minion tomorrow to make a minion. By the way, we're looking at everyone here, we're gonna be there tomorrow. Good, you're laughing, it's funny. But that is the choice for the Jewish people. We can either fall into the illusion that everything is chance. Some people, they make it big, they get lucky. I've used that phrase, unfortunately, a few times. Or you say everything's in the hand of Hashem. It's not luck at all. There's no luck of, there's no luck of the draw. Everything is from Shemaim. It's not fair. But nonetheless, it's in the hands of heaven. The book of Esther is very unique in the Tanakh because it's the only book that doesn't have Hashem's name in it even one time. There is no other book in the Tanakh that has this, this, this element. What's going on is that you can, you can read the, the book of Esther however you like. You can either read it that it's a political diatribe. Historically, maybe it never happened. It seems unlikely that the Persian rulers married outside of the royal families, but that we don't see recorded. It's, it's one of the major elements of um, historical um, conjecture about the book of Esther. They say, well, you know, we don't see any records of the per of, of Persian kings marrying outside the royal family, like in this story. Or we can say that, no, this is all about the hidden world. This is all about the world where Hashem does run the world. And that's what Esther's name, Esther Panim. Her name means hiddenness. Esther is from the root Hester, to be hidden. When I think about this subject in general, I'm reminded of a very nice story I heard from a Rabbi Vidar Svadi, um, who is mentioned who he is. He runs a healer in America. And uh, one night, he was uh, running Friday night service and he was at the Bima meeting and greeting people, just you know, giving out sweets to the kids and shaking hands with people, just like every other rabbi does in every other community. And a seven-year-old seven boy walked up to him and he said, Rabbi, why is Hashem invisible? Now, it happened to be that the rabbi was in front of the entire kahila, everyone leans in, they want to know what the rabbi is going to answer. So this particular rabbi is a big haha, much more so than myself. And he was thinking, you know, do I answer the boy according to like a philosophical answer? He's a seven-year-old boy. What kind of answer do I need to give him? Do I need to spell it out, you know, the way the Rambam does? You know, he's not, he's non -comporeal. Do I want to give like some kind of Hasidic answer that's going to maybe work for all the other people who are judging my rabbinical career based on how I answer the seven-year-old boy? By the way, this happens a lot. A little, a little child asks you a question and every, all the parents are like, okay, let's see if the rabbi knows how to answer the kid. And uh, the rabbi answered the son in the most beautiful way, the most important way you possibly can in terms of education. You know what he said to him? What do you think? That's a great question, what do you think? By the way, any, any education that isn't based on answering, asking the students, what do you think, isn't really education, it's indoctrination. What's the question? The question is, why is Hashem invisible? Where, where's Hashem? He's in, where's, why is Hashem invisible? So he answered back to the kid, that's a great, wow, a chacham, what a beautiful question, what do you think? I'm all about education and less about indoctrination. The boy smiled and he said, if Hashem, if we could see him, then we wouldn't have to play hide and seek with Hashem. It's a profound answer because that's what we do. We have lives that run, I don't know about your life, my life does not run like clockwork. So if you go, little kids, you know, we say an early night uh, depends on when my son decides to go to sleep, which is normally somewhere between about 3 and 5 a.m. that he decides to, you know, that that's a good time to go to sleep. We live in a world where if we want to pretend that there's no Hashem, 
okay, very good. We'll play the stock market, we'll play the lottery, we'll believe in whatever philosophy, whatever, whatever's pertinent to, to our situation, whatever empowers us to have the right answer at the right time. Or we accept that there's a force beyond what we see, a force beyond what we're capable of controlling. That's what that's the experience we've been going through for the last few years is, oh, look, we think we're getting out of this. There's another barrier. I think it's all going to be relaxed. There's another lockdown. I think the synagogue is going to open. Turns out not. We're not in control. We, we're playing hide and seek with Hashem. The most profound part for me of the Purim story is that no matter how we like to enjoy our Purim celebrations, I, I'm sure that everyone here, they enjoy Purim, the kids, it's great, right? It's, it's, it's the best day of the year. There's so many sweeties. You think that, uh, you think that the synagogue's working for the dentists, you know? There's so many sweets on the going on, you think that probably everyone's working for the dentistry division, you know, it's, a, it's like it's the only day of the year when you could like actually uh, end up with some kind of terrible blood sugar problem because there's so many sweets, everybody's drinking, everyone's having a great time. But what are we reading in the Megillah Esther? Have you read the story? It's about a tyrannical king who murders his wife in a drunken stupor because she doesn't appear naked before the entire court. It's about ministers suggesting that the best way to get over this problem of there not being a king that we've just murdered is, uh, I guess, perhaps we should enforce the marriage of hundreds of young women from across 127 different provinces and make a diabaco of a spectacle of each of them and enslave them all into a marriage they don't want, with no rights. And out of all of these girls, we'll pick one of them to be king. Of course, we'll hold on to all the girls, right? A cruel, power-hungry minister, Haman, because he gets a personal insult from someone not bowing on the floor to him, will destroy an entire people, will kill off an entire people. That's what, that's what we're reading about on Purim. I don't know if you, if you open the book of Esther, that's, that's what it's about. That's what, we're, that's what we're dealing with. It's a terrible story. It's a terrifying story. It's one that hopefully sends shockwaves through each of us. It's the most terrible story. If you really look at what's happening, the actual narrative. And this narrative is very important in terms of Torah, because this is the age old narrative of the Torah. This is something that we deal with all the time. In the story of the Garden of Eden, we know that good and evil in this world is completely mixed up now. There's no clear divisions, there's no black and white, rather it's all gray. The person here has to work out what's good and what's not good all by themselves. Turns out what your parents taught you, the next generation questions. What the government tells you depends on which government. What, what the vogue of the day can be, can be very evil. And yet we can all tacitly go along with it because we're scared of being the voice against it. The Talmud in Megillah in 12a, suggests that the Jewish people received this terrible decree of destruction because they had a great time at the party of Ahasuerus. Seems a bit extreme. But we also see this idea in last week's Pasha in our, in our Humash in the terms of the story of the golden calf. Moshe comes back near the camp we heard the, we heard, you know, heard of, didn't hear a voice of war. So it's a, a voice of levity that I, that I hear. And he saw the dancing and he became enraged. And that's when he saw the dancing and the celebrating, that's when he threw the tablets down. It wasn't just that the Jewish people were worshiping idols and they were get, getting drunk and having a good time. It was the celebration of evil 
as positivity as good that really cut the bone. And so too it was in the story of, of Ahasuerus' party, the Jewish people didn't have to be there. They were under no obligation to be there, but there was a great party. Who could turn down a great party? Kosher food, kosher wine. We're all going along with the, with the show. And in the end, you're, you're a bystander to the supporting of immorality. You're there enjoying everybody else's debauchery downfall. As we enjoy our wealth, we, it only comes from the expense of billions of people. If you have a smartphone and recording it, where do you think the cobalt come from? Where do you think, how do you think it's made? It's not made by affluence, it's made by the enslavement of others. Our lives work that way. So on Purim, we have to do the exact opposite. We take this terrifying story and we turn it into the most family friendly, most enjoyable, most senua celebration we can. We take a story about the theft of children, about murder, about the possible annihilation, we turn it into a carnival. We're able to do that. We have the spiritual power to do that. But the only way we can do that is first to accept that the world is an upside down world. For as long as we prioritize physicality and transient ideals over what has worked for millennia, as long as we're gonna pay pop stars and sporting heroes and political people, persons, I guess you can say today, over nurses who work tirelessly for us, over the people who make it happen. As long as we're gonna reward people who basically indulge our pleasures rather than people who are committed to acts of kindness, morality in the face of evil, then we're gonna keep having this world. I don't know if anybody's following the news right now in terms of this truck driver uh, situation in Canada. It was very easy to pretend that the truck drivers were on the bottom of the pile and these aren't the people making it happen. They can bring a whole country to a standstill in a second. The power of the individual, the people in, ch in charge of our service, the people in charge of the lowest divisions of our economy are actually holding the reins of power. A very, very difficult and necessary lesson for us all to accept is it's not the people wearing the suits and ties who are, who are in control of the world, but actually the people who are making it happen are being paid the least, our agricultural workers. You know what would happen if there was an agricultural strike? Lower layman. We wouldn't want to think about it. In any country on the planet, an agricultural strike for any amount of time, we would all go under financially in a second. We live in a world that pretends to be dog eat dog. Every man for themselves, survival for the fittest. You be a, be a man, my son, you go out and get them. And our lesson to the world is a lesson of community, supporting the weak, acts of loving kindness and charity. We have to realize that what we're teaching the world is rebellion. That is our purpose is to teach the world rebellion against these ideals. We're here to teach a better world, a world of morality. Purim is a time when we can be anybody we want. We can dress up like Superman, we can put on a mask. I think I speak for everyone when I say we've all had a little bit enough of masks for a few years, you know, to <laughs> had enough. Maybe this Purim will be, please God around the world, a maskless Purim. Mir Hashem. Why can we dress up like whatever we want on Purim? Because our worth isn't defined by the costume that we put on or by the job that we do. Our worth, according to the Torah, is measured in our personality and our strength of character. And the heroes of our people have always been people who've stood up against tyrants, against oppressive regimes, against situations that were unfair and done the right thing. Those are the heroes of our people. 
So if you want to get dressed up like a bank manager on Purim, you want to get dressed up like a clown. It's an upside down world. Maybe the clown's more righteous than the, than the diplomat. We don't know. Being a Jew in an upside down world is very, very simple. Provided you're willing to turn yourself the right way around. That's what being a Jew is all about. Is to understand that no matter what it is I do, today I'm playing the rabbi, and sometimes I'm the mashkia, I'd rather be playing the guitar lots of the time. What we do isn't who we are, and it's not how we're going to be judged upstairs. We're not going to be asked upstairs, you know, were you the best lawyer you could be? Were you the best you know, counsel advisor you could be? You know, did you play the lottery or the stock market the best, better than everyone else? Did you bet on the right horse? We're going to be asked if, given our particular test, our particular problems, our particular time that we were born into, did we, were we the best people we could have been? It's a much harder test upstairs. No one's going to, no, you don't, we, we, we had, unfortunately, the funeral this week. Did you see the, the gross net salaries written on any of those gravestones in, in, the, in the graveyard? Did you see the, the PhD after their name on any of those graves? Or the accolades written about these people? Nothing. It's between us and ourselves to know how we're doing. And for that, we really have to be brave. We have to be brave enough to make the changes that we know we have to make. We're on the way now towards Pesach. We're starting this week. We're starting with Ashkalim. We're counting down the time to our freedom. Freedom from what? From ourselves. From all of the negative obstacles and blocks that we put upon ourselves of who we can't be. I'm, I'm not religious. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not a super. I'm not. There's a lot of knots. Purim is a time for deciding who would you like to be. If you want to be Superman for the day, you can be Superman for the day. You want to be a clown for the day, that's fine. We have to believe in ourselves ultimately to that level, that we understand that what we do as for a living, what we, what we pride ourselves on being is more often than not a costume. It's a defense mechanism. And who we really are depends on the real character and our morals, and the things that we stand for in our heart. I hope that that's inspiration enough to help us to take off the mask this Purim, regardless who we're going to be. Thank you. I want to throw out the floor to any questions. I want to apologize to our Zoomers that uh, can't uh, ask um, questions because we're plugged into the audio system. Is there any, any questions from the floor? Then, then we'll stop here. I want to invite everybody for refreshments and thank everybody for attending. Thank everyone for attending digitally as well. Thank you so much. Thank you.